My name's Doug Green, and I'm interviewing Robert. General Robert Hipwell. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Doug. <laughs> Who I, I met through um, Toastmasters. He's in the same Toastmasters group I'm in. And at first, when they called him the general, I thought they were just kidding. But then I found out later he really is a general. <laughs> Retired general, right? Retired general. But I don't think I've ever known a general before. And I have my own adventure stories, and I started talking with the general, <laughs> Robert, about some of his own past experiences, both in Vietnam and Afghanistan and other things he's done. And it was fascinating. What I'm interested in finding out, the reason I want to interview him is he's led a really good life. He seems pretty together. <laughs> right. Great guy. You know, he's... I, if I had known he'd been in the military about from hearing it, I never would have guessed it. It doesn't seem like somebody that's rigid and just, <laughs> yeah, he's relaxed, easy to talk with. Um, somebody I'm really stoked to call friend. So I know that in his work in his life, having been in Vietnam on the front lines, being in Afghanistan and all of that, that he's probably had some incredible experiences where he's learned some life lessons that I hope we can pass on to the viewers that you can use in your own life. So he's in this podcast, which is called What Makes Them Tick, Learn Life Lessons from Extraordinary People. I see Robert as somebody who has led an extraordinary life and likely has some really incredible lessons to teach us. So Robert, thank you for joining us. You're welcome, Doug. Thanks for having me here with you today. It's an awesome adventure for me to talk to to another high-spirited, adventurous person <laughs> like yourself. So I think we can we gleam off each other and we kind of inspire each other to talk about and learn about each other's adventures. And it kind of it's interesting to hear other people like yourself that have such a high high threshold for adventures and the zest for life, as we <laughs> say, right? Yeah. So why don't we begin at the beginning? Maybe we can give the overview first. We're going to talk about. Um, at least three phases of your life. You've mentioned there might be four. Yeah. Uh, why don't you Fourth name what those are? Okay. First of all, Doug, thank you again for uh, talking with me here today. I, uh, in a broad, broad, very concise way, I guess you could say I'm the son of an immigrant family, right? My father and mother were born in England, so was I. Came to to California uh, via Canada first. And then I, I went to high school in San Diego, grew up in San Diego, and during that time, at the height of the Vietnam War in 68, the draft was going on. I anticipated I would get drafted anyway, joined the yeah. Army, signed up for three years, and all I wanted to do initially in the Army was to be a paratrooper. I saw a lot of movies and videos about World War II and paratroopers and 101st Airborne. And so I joined the Army to be a paratrooper, and I, I did join the Army, and I was, uh, we went the buddy system at that time. A movie came out. Uh, called the John Wayne and the Green Berets. I remember that right. movie. <laughs> it, it, it it took me over the edge. I was thinking about going in the Army. San Diego is a Navy and Marine Corps environment. And um, my buddy in high school went in the Navy, was a shore patrolman, and told us all the war stories about how they treated the Marines. So I, I kind of got turned off by going into the Marines, joined the Army. And at the height of the Vietnam War, 1968, we had half a million soldiers in Vietnam plus. So they had a huge standing army in Vietnam. And uh, they had a, a, in 1968, we lost a lot of people, NCOs, first sergeants, and second lieutenants. So the army had a school set up to quickly promote sergeants and lieutenants. So I went to a 90-day program at 18 years old, and I was a sergeant in 90 days at 18. As soon as I got to be a sergeant, I went to ranger school, airborne school, and then psh, over to Vietnam. So I, I did a tour in Vietnam as a long-range reconnaissance patrol, assistant patrol leader. There were six of us on the teams. On those teams, we went out 50 to 100 miles in the enemy's uh, area to do reconnaissance and surveillance and report back to higher of what was going on with the enemy activity, mostly along the Asha Valley on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. So after my career oh. uh, from bit oh yeah well, let's go ahead we had we had yeah. some quite adventurous times in that and I could I could tell you some more but I'm just trying to do a quick yeah. overview yeah. so after Vietnam came back after three years and uh, came back to San Diego worked in a shipyard with my dad for about six months <laughs> then they ran out of contracts got laid off and I decided to go to England because my wife I had met uh, during my t time in the army was British went to went to Great Britain for three years went to school at night 
on the GI Bill, stayed in the reserve component, and then when I came back three years later, I uh, joined the California National Guard, and they had an a officer training program, which they I was selected for. went into that. Two years later, I became a lieutenant. So I worked myself up from a lieutenant um, in the reserve, uh, National Guard. Then I switched from the National Guard to the Army Reserve, and then I kept going up in, in rank, and before you know it, um, I'm an officer, then I got to be a captain of Special Forces, then I got into Special Forces, uh, U.S. Army Green Berets, was an A-team commander for 10 years, and then after that I went into military police, and towards the uh, latter part of my military career was I had the good fortune and the people I worked with were very good, was able to get promoted to Brigadier General, took a command over to Iraq as a commanding general for the 300th military police, and we were in, I was in charge of the largest detainee operations in the world at that time, 20,000 detainees down in Camp Buka in southern Iraq for the first part of the tour, and then they moved. we moved up north to be the task force north. So I worked in the same location as uh, Saddam Hussein, and um, I was there earlier on on another tour when we got the two sons, and, and towards the end of that tour, in December of '03, we actually captured Saddam, and we, we kept him in our compounds, the compounds that we kept him up in Baghdad. So that was a, quite an adventurous time, but my, I consider my three phases in the military to be an enlisted, as, as, as ending as a sergeant, to being an officer, to being a general officer in the Army. So that's kind of three main focuses of my life there. And subsequent to that, I'm very fortunate and blessed to have a large family. My wife and I have nine children between us. We, uh, we have uh, seven sons and two beautiful daughters, one of which you met today. And uh, of my sons, six of my seven sons have been in the Army. Three are still serving in uniform. And to this day, one is still in Afghanistan. He's a Special Forces medic and Special Forces team sergeant in Afghanistan right now. So uh, my sons have followed me in the military. And that was one of my ways of helping them get their education because I let my uncle pay for the education instead of their dad. <laughs> Same way I got my education because um, I got all my education. I actually do, as you probably know, have two PhDs, an earned PhD and an honorary PhD, three master's degrees and a couple of bachelor's degrees. But all that was based on the GI Bill and working through night school uh, my entire career and having a full-time job and raising a family. So nobody's ever going to convict you of being an underachiever, are they? <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I, I think that... <laughs> yeah, that's probably a true statement, right, Doug? Ah, uh, um, so let's let's dive into. A, we'll come back to the to later part. Now he's helping veterans, but we can dig into that later. I'm really let's go back to this when you're in the military the first time around. Okay, you're on the forward lines. You're working on the as basically scouting operations. Right, long range reconnaissance patrols is okay. what what they're called. So you're what you're out there to do is to find what's going on, get information, get in, get out, not get killed. Correct. And come back with the best quality information you can, right? Right. Radio it back and bring it back. So it was two-way communications. We're in the field. We're always communicating to hire what we're looking at. So if they want to have, a, we call it actionable intelligence. If we find something that at higher headquarters wants to, for example, destroy, then they'll call in an airstrike. They'll call in B-52 bombers, they'll call in artillery or whatever. But our job is to immediately report activity that we see and it, periodically. And then once we get back, they debrief us as far as the whole mission. It could be a five to seven day mission typically. So that's the what. But let's let's dig okay. into the how because I think that's the real interesting part. There's six of you. You right. dropped in by either parachute or helicopter. Helicopter, yeah. U U Huey helicopters. So they, they drop you in right into enemy territory. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. And you got, there okay. you are. <laughs> right. You're there for, for the duration. And as you mentioned, our job is not to make any contact with the enemy, what's the f whatever. It's just to be quiet, go really slow, and observe and report back. So talk about what that's like. How do you not get seen? How do you <laughs> deal with situations where you do get seen how do you work cohesively as a team what makes a team work what makes a team not work things like that okay well you know the day-to-day -day stuff sure like just the, 
being there. Oh. Well, all right. The, the, day, the day-to-day stuff is, is a challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, the Army in those days was a draft army. So if you uh, volunteered to be in a unit such as I was, in the Ranger unit, you were, you were a volunteer. So they, they were more or less all wanted to be there versus a conventional infantry unit, which would be people just serving because they got drafted. So in a, in a higher um, mission unit, my higher purpose mission unit, for example, everybody volunteered to be in this unit. So we had been, uh, I, like I mentioned earlier, I'd gone to a lot of training stateside before I was sent overseas. Uh, advanced training, ranger school, which is uh, two months long, Recondo school, quite a few series of training before I got to Vietnam. And once I got there, I was assigned to a team as the assistant patrol leader, uh, as an E5, and it was run by an E6. Uh, so I had some se- a senior person to me who I could coach, teach, and mentor f- from him. So, And then we had four other people on the team that we worked together. We trained while we were in the, in the rear. We typically had five to seven days out two to three days back. So the first day we came back, we were basically refreshed and, and trying to get back into a situation. But the other two days we're training, always working together, always knowing each other's strong points and weak points so we could anticipate any problems we might have out in the field together. So we lived in the same Quonset huts together. We went to chow together. We exercise together we the did whole rehearsals. point is basically to become one yeah right become a, a cohesive unit right yeah so that but so i get that part so you're out there i it sounds like one of the things that really helps is the amount of training you, you basically when a situation comes you already have a pre you've got a plan a sop they call plan yeah, B. A, a standard operating procedure okay. right <laughs> right right yeah right so we have a we practice we rehearse if we get ambushed from the right side, what happens? If we get ambushed from the left side, what happens? So we practice and rehearse that before we go out to the field. But whatever happens out there is going to be unique, but we have scenarios for as many uh, opportunities that might come our way as, as we can. So having that pre-planned stand, the standard operating procedure, um, talk about the value of that. Well, I, I think that it's it's it has to be ingrained in you muscle memory so that if if something happens in the field you don't have to think about it hey what's happening because it's a life or death situation so you have to make decisions based on what's coming at you to negate that situation and be victorious and come through and get your mission completed and get you all out of there safely so talk about that the reason one reason i'm asking you about this there was a moment when i was in a motorcycle accident i hit an antelope at 70 miles an hour oh wow uh head on and i had recently taken an advanced motorcycle driving class and i remember they talked about the patches and the you know it's like you're looking at these different um forces happening forward force sideway force and the idea is you don't want to change your movement patch or else you're going down so if you're go, you want to stay in a straight line Keep going in a straight line and don't do anything that's going to mess that up if you can. And when I hit the antelope, there was just this moment of, you know, kind of like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) But then that the lessons learned from that advanced writing class kind of dropped into place. Carried over. Yeah. It was like, okay, don't do any, don't turn, don't do something stupid. Don't hit the brakes if you've got a straight line. And I knew to ride that straight line out. And that's what saved my life, probably, or at least from, you know, I didn't drop the bike. Wow. The antelope went underneath the bike, locked up the rear wheel, and we slid for 150 feet. And then it <sighs> came off, and then the bike took off, you know, it was because the throttle was locked on high. Right. And there just a series of maneuvers I made that came automatically. Well, I'm assuming, and I remember how cool that was that it happened. And I can imagine that... In your situation, it's amplified by a hundred when there's people all around you, there's bullets whizzing by, and yeah, I can only imagine. So what is the, um, talk about what the feeling is like when you actually move into response mode. Do you even feel anything? Are you thinking about anything? Does it just happen automatically? It, it, it more or less, like you said, it, it happens automatically, instinctively. It's like, uh, analogy, like you mentioned, is into a, uh, automobile or a motorcycle accident where things happen 
instantaneously and you start to think about them later and reflect what did I do how could I have done it better what about this what about that so in a, in a combat situation you're trained to expect certain scenarios and you you're trained and trained and trained some more and rehearse and train so when something does happen you automatically go into reflex mode and you react based to, uh, on your reflexes or muscle memory and then later when things calm down to a certain extent then you start thinking about you know logically and plus you remember as most combat is is engaged by people that are young under 25 for example i was 18 19 years old so in one respect you almost feel bulletproof right the fear of dying is <laughs> not there like it is when you get a little older you yeah. think oh man what was i thinking <laughs> right what was that why did i do that right so you got that that young eager that won't happen to me thought and it's your bulletproof for one thing and then you know but other people on other teams are getting killed and wounded you know that that possibility is available to to happen to you however you think because of your training your expertise and and your confidence in the men around you that they're going to look after your back and you're going to look after their back that you're going to be fine <laughs> so it sounds like part of it of this is just getting out of your own way <laughs> right and the training really teaches you how to do that that thinking part that gets in there that can set up that that extra little bit of time that can make the difference between life and death is kind of removed because you know instinctively what to do. Right. Um, so talk about working as a unit. There's six of you there. It's one thing if you're just responding on your own, but to work as a group in that way is like taking it to another level. So you you train together. I assume they're sort of these, I don't know, maybe you learn how other you mentioned that they're strong. Each guy has their strengths Tricks and weaknesses, weaknesses, right? And you probably rearrange yourselves or the energetics of the group so that you're each playing to your strengths. Like Correct. the guy that shoots best on the right side at right. X yardage, that's where he goes, or right. something like that. For, yeah, for example, I'm a left-handed shooter, so I, I would most of the time guard the right side of the trail because my weapon would be at the ready position so I could bring it up. So I would be focused on the right side of the trail. A right-handed shooter would have his weapon slung for the left-hand side so he could look on the left-hand side of the trail. But for example, before we go out, uh, even before we go out in the field, there's a, a two to three day preparation period. Well, in the jungle, everything smells dirty, rotten, and smelly, right? Yeah. So once we get our mission assigned to us, we stop taking showers, we stop brushing our teeth, we stop putting any foo-foo smells on us, so we're already stinky by the time we go out to the field, <laughs> right? So we, because you can, your senses really get alerted when you're out in the field, they go to a higher level. You can smell things in the jungle that you you wouldn't smell going back there. After three days, you smell so bad you really don't smell yourself anymore. Uh -huh. And then we we thoroughly uh, look at our equipment, and make sure we don't have any rattles, anything that makes metallic sounds. For example, on our weapons, on the dust cover of our weapons, we taped a cigarette butt to the dust cover of our weapon in case we had to pull our weapon back to cock it or move it then it wouldn't make it a metallic sound when the dust cover opened up so we go through <laughs> and and we tape things down we shake and inspect each other we have oh we take all our water with us we have bladders of water and if somebody opens a canteen we pass it around the group and we all drink the same canteen water so we don't have any movement of water making noise while we're moving on our trails we typically went very slow we move for 50 minutes and stop for 10 minutes to catch our breath and so we wouldn't get caught in the triple canopy jungle and try and get frustrated to move and make noise. Move for 50 minutes, rest for 10, and at night, one of us at all times was awake. So we'd take turns, we'd get into a wagon wheel sort of environment. We'd pass the, the radio, you would have it from one to two, the next person would have it from two to three, and so on and so on. Uh -huh. And our higher headquarters, Every hour, we had to come on the phone and listen. We wouldn't talk. We would never talk out in the field. It's always a whisper or hand and arm signal. So we had to do that. So at nighttime, our higher headquarters would call us. They usually have five to six teams out there in the in the uh, environment, and they would call us up and say, "Our team was two one two. They say team one two team one two. If your situation is negative, break squelch twice. So all we had to do was." on our hand receiver, just go chick -o, chick -o. Uh -huh. So we wouldn't have to talk. So they knew that we were okay, and that was our SOP, that everything was okay with us. 
And if we miss three consecutive uh, situation reports, then they figure the worst and they'd send a reaction team out to our location, our last known location, to, they would anticipate that we had been either killed or captured. Now, this is before GPSs were in use, so well, they didn't know yep. exactly where you were. You Way know? before GPSs, yes. Yeah, so they, they generally knew on the map, like, okay, they're covering the 75 to 100 miles, they're moving at Oh, no, no. It's way smaller than that. They had like six teams out in the area. We had maybe, at the most, three or four mile box on the map, grid squares. So we had three or four miles that we would travel through. And we'd set up, we maybe move a mile a day huh. from one location to the other. And slowly, we would never stay in the same spot twice. We would never sleep in the same area twice. And when we camped at night, just in case they had observed us and we didn't know that, we would, just before dusk, we would set up, sit down and be quiet and prepare to move to another place. And when it got dark, we would leave the last place that we were at and go to another place for the night. So if someone saw yeah. us in the jungle and they go, oh, they're over there by those trees. Once it got dark, we would slowly and quietly move to another location and sit up there for the night and start the whole sequence over again. And only one of us would eat at a time, so we didn't ever want to be compromised. We never had any campfires. It was all long range rations where you put water in a condensed food packet and eat that way. And we many times had were able to observe and, and report from enemy activity based on their cooking and their campfire smell so we could smell their food coming down downwind to us. Hmm. So did you ever... Have, did you have to face off with the enemy from time to time? Uh, yes, we did. What and was it, that like? <laughs> <laughs> quite an exciting adventure, to tell you the truth. <laughs> one adventure that really sticks out and the most predominant uh, adventure was uh, on one mission we were on, on our second day, we were, uh, on a, we were monitoring. We never actually go on the top of a trail, but there was a high-speed trail, dirt trail, that the enemy would use as resupply trail so we walk along 10 to 15 yards to the side of each trail and, and observe the trail at the top so we were paralleling this high-speed trail on about our second day in and we heard some enemy activity on the trail so we 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 quietly got down in a crouch position pulled our weapons up and we're so trained that we're not to allow we're not allowed to engage fire unless our team commander team sergeant engages he's the one that initiates the fire so no one, if they get afraid, they don't pull the gun and, and compromise everybody. So anyway, we're all, we hear these, uh, the enemy coming down the trail. <laughs> we all have our weapons up. We're all camouflaged up. We're all sweaty. And we all could see the people started walking through the trail. They had a flank guard on both sides of their patrol. And the flank guard didn't see us, but he happened to come about 10 feet from us. And then he had to uh, relieve himself. <laughs> so he had his AK-47 slung over his shoulder down on the ground, started to relieve himself in our direction, and he caught our eyes and we caught his eyes. He knew the second he saw us that we were all pointing our weapons right at his chest. And he knew, and this was all instantaneous, and he knew that if he even tried to pick up his weapon, he'd be dead before he could even raise it halfway <laughs> up. Because we had our weapons on automatic ready to engage, waiting for our team sergeant to engage. We didn't engage at that time. So he kind of looked at us. He saw what was going on. He slowly zipped up his pants, backed up to the trail, and started yelling in Vietnamese. And then the whole column of Vietnamese ran down the trail, and, and we still were there waiting. We didn't engage them at that point. They got down the trail, and our team sergeant said, basically, give us the high sign to get the hell out of there. So as soon as we got... As soon as we decided to get out of there, and all hell broke loose. They came at, they started to attack us, right? All, there was about 28 to 30 that we could imagine, we counted. So there must have been more than that. So 28 to 30 guys were attacking us. So we took off in the opposite direction and, uh, and they were in pursuit of us. So it was firefight erupted. Fortunately, none of us were shot, ambushed, or um, hurt by hand grenades or anything else we were able to evade the enemy after about four hours we put so much distance between us and them that we were able to get detached from them 
Well, we were in triple canopy jungle. We couldn't land a helicopter. We told Hire, and they sent out a rescue party to help us. But the triple canopy jungle, they couldn't land the helicopter <laughs> anywhere else. So we, we found a spot that was not so densely populated. We put our claymores on the ground, claymore mines, and we blew a hole in the canopy so that the helicopters could lower ropes down, <laughs> could lower ropes down, so they did. Three helicopters came over, dropped two ropes in uh, on either side of the helicopter. We had Swiss seats set up that we could tie around our waist with a Swiss seat with a... Uh, a bowline. A bowline, right, a bowline. <laughs> and uh, so they hoisted us out of the jungle two at a time, going upside down, and they took us to the Ashaw Valley about an hour away, so we were hanging upside down this helicopter spinning around in circles as we were taken out of the jungle. We all survived that mission. And it was it was August the sixth, nineteen seventy. And to this day we have we communicate with each other and we call that upside down day. <laughs> 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 so ah. <laughs> snap link. Yeah, we, we had the rope hooked it into the snap link. We all carried six foot of rope mm -hmm. and a snap link just for those situations in case we had to get extracted at the last minute. Snap links like a beaner, carabiner? Yeah, carabiner. We call uh -huh. them snap links in the early carabiner. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but we, wow. we kept all our equipment. We we were not going to leave any equipment behind so that the enemy could use against us or uh -huh. any of our troops. So we took all our backpacks. And as soon as we got past the first layer of trees, we were inverted because of our heavy backpacks upside down, spinning uh, in circles <laughs> underneath the helicopter. And yeah. when they did land... We were so disoriented and upside down, we couldn't even get up. The, the door gunners <laughs> had to come over and grab us and pull us into the aircraft to get us the hell out of there. <laughs> um, so from that period of time, what are the three biggest lessons you could pass on? Well, the biggest lesson is teamwork matters. You're not there for your own personal safety. You're there for your buddy next to you. So you go in as a team. You come out as a team. You work together as a team. And if the team succeeds, you succeed. Right? And you do lose friends along the way through uh, through combat, through sickness or illness. But some, you know, the core team, four or five members, stays together, but they do rotate in between from that. So I would say teamwork is the core. Having to know your strengths and weaknesses and know your buddy's strengths and weaknesses is another important aspect of that. And then motivation and drive. Why are you doing this, right? You're doing it for the unit and to support the unit and their unit mission. So those are the three big things. So the motivation, um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So in addition to those three elements of, of lessons learned, of uh, looking after your buddy and your buddy there looking after you, you know, completing the mission and uh, having focus is that the next part of that I think is very important is that the human body can do a lot more than most people ever anticipate can do, right? Instead of the normal things, if you put your body, you task your body, not, not a one-time thing, but you can if you need to. But it, in the training that leads up to that, you put your body to a very a lot of extremes, right? For lack of sleep, physical endurance, mm -hmm. um, a lot of physical demands on your body. And your body can take it for the most part, unless you don't, you don't get to the failure point. But going to ranger school, you have limited sleep, you have limited food, you walk equivalent of 200 miles in two months, right? You're up most of the night. So a similar situation in combat. And I know from my experience in Vietnam and my experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, the higher you are in rank, typically the less sleep you get at night. Generals as a in whole, when they're in combat, sleep less than four hours a night. That's the demand you put on your body because you need the time and focus and attention to do a myriad of, of duties and tasks and functions. So the demands you put on the human body, you, you can train your body to do what we would think to be superhuman things for the most part, but it's a matter of training the, bat, the body up and getting used to that and, and enduring those long terms. Is there a, I'm really curious about the four hours of sleep part, um, is there a point at which you kind of have to like, you can maybe do that for a month or two or three, and then at some point it's like you just sleep solid for four days in a row? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's a good point. Well. It comes and goes. Actually, having been, having had six combat tours uh, from Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, uh, the higher up, I, I worked with generals. I worked on the general staff, and I worked for the general 
in, in, in Iraq when the war first kicked off in 2003, he got two to three hours a night. He did this for at least six months straight. That wow. I see. He'd go to bed at like one o'clock in the morning. He'd be back in the office by four o'clock in the morning at the latest. So <laughs> you can do that if the situation is demands it and you need to perform at that level. You can do that almost indefinitely. But at some point, like General Stan McChrystal, for example, he slept less than four hours a night. He he ate only one meal a day. When the Rolling Stone reporter was attached to him and watched him yeah. him around, he he never he was with him for like six weeks, solid, and he only saw him eat twice in that six week period. He ate one meal a day, so and he slept less than four hours a day. So he's high energy person. He's motivated. He's self-driven. He's responsible for a lot of men's lives, a lot of men and women's lives. So he takes his job seriously. So here's a question. Do you think that's um, the nature versus nurture question? Is that something that he already had that maybe others don't? And maybe he rose up through the ranks in part because he just had that capacity to keep going and going and going, whereas others might not find it? Or is that something that he developed along the way, or is it a combination? I, I think it's a combination of both. Knowing Stan McChrystal was both a ranger and special forces officer prior, before becoming a general, and they push your mo your physical extremes, your mental extremes, and you're, you're trained. And as you move up in the military, like in the civilian world, you have more responsibility and more things that you're responsible for, so you expect more, more expectations. So it's kind of a, a trained thing. Part of it's being trained, and part of it's being, if you can't make the stand, in the military, like in the civilian world, if you can't make it, you don't get promoted. Yeah, there's a filtering process right. that's Filt going on here. <laughs> right. and, and there's certain requirements, physical requirement, mental uh, component to that, yeah. and, and educational component. The military, you have to have military classes, education to move up. You have to have physical standards. You have to be able to shoot accurately. You have to have a lot of different standards yeah. in order to move up. Okay, let's go on to the next phase um, in your military career, which is, uh, describe that. The officer phase. After Vietnam, I got a reserve commission in the state of California as a from OCS, California Military Academy, to become a lieutenant. So it was a two-year program, joined the National Guard in San Diego, and for two years, which was one weekend a month and two summer camps, at the end of the second summer camp, you're commissioned as a dual commission. You get a state of California commission and then you get a federal commission simultaneous to that so they, they meet all the standards of the army uh, however you're working for the state governor and, okay. and except for times of emergency and we know in california for example we have four seasons fires floods earthquakes and riots <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so if the governor determines that he needs assistance because he doesn't have the resources to put out fires or there's a flood that they can't de deal with, or there's a riot in L.A. or anywhere else <laughs> in the state that the state's resources can't handle, he'll call in federal assistance, right? So uh -huh. so you get a dual commission, and most of the time you work for the state governor in any state. But then there are times when you work for the federal, like, for example, in Desert Storm and in the most recent, in 2003 in Iraq, at one point, 53% of the troops on the ground were a reserve component, either National Guard or reserve component, because the active duty strength was not there in numbers like it was in World War II. We had 150,000 troops on the ground at the peak of um, the Iraqi second Iraqi the war. Surge. The surge. The uh surge. -huh. And then we, 53% um, of the troops were reserve components. Well, that, that could wow. be good and bad, because as we saw on the bad side of that, Abu Ghraib came out of that, and that was the debacle from the Viet, uh, from uh, from the Iraq War, and that was that was a reserve component military police unit out of New York that that got disbanded and got disheartened. And I, I was there at Abu Ghraib. I was the provost marshal for Iraq during that period. I kept advising my generals, we need to get out there and provide these guys more resources. And it was really a hellhole out there. But the general told me, hey Bob, there's a lot of hellholes in Iraq, so we'll deal with that when we come to it. But in either case, uh, Abu Ghraib happened, and that was a reserve component unit that wasn't didn't have the leadership and the experience, the many, many years it takes, like an active component, to get to that level. They, they were called up six months before the war started. They extended them over in there in Iraq. 
for another 90 days and their morale went south and the leadership wasn't up to speed to to handle the mission. Hmm. If you could give that group advice now, um, not maybe not the group, but the people that, I don't know, how, would, how could it have been done differently? The situation in Abu? Yeah. Well, We're talking about a scenario that went south now. Yeah, the, the, in Abu, well, Abu is is a hotbed for uh, insurgency. It's, it's close to Ramadi and Fallujah. It's within 20 minutes to a half hour at the most. So they would come and attack it almost every day, drop mortars in, drop by mortars at the back of a small truck, and then get back on the road and leave. So it was attacked. And at one time, I had lunch uh, two days ago with a friend of mine who was in Abu with me. He flew in from out of town on a business trip, and we were reminiscing about that. And at one point, 39 people were killed, and 115 were killed in one attack. So these attacks happened almost daily in Abu Ghraib prison, which is about a 40-acre complex with high walls around it. They would lob mortars in and, and artillery rounds in uh, on occasion, but mostly mortar rounds and do a, once in a while a ground attack. Well, the resources they had there weren't trained for external protection. An MP unit like that is trained for internal protection and securing the detainees and prisoners of war if there is any. So all of a sudden you have a vulnerability and an right. enemy that seems to be very quick at adapting to to weaknesses. Opportunities, yeah. Right. yeah. Just like any war, they look for a weakness and they try to, to exploit the weakness. And then in that situation, there wasn't enough ground forces on the outside to protect the, the environment fully. And as we had gone into uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom with less troops than we normally do, I would say, because I, I think the Department of Defense, Rumsfeld's whole philosophy, and I can sum Rumsfeld's whole philosophy up in six words, and my, my interpretation is more toys, less boys, outsource it. So once again, more toys, less boys, outsource it, meaning he wanted to use high-tech weapons to supplement the regular trigger pullers. Uh, so we only had 150,000 troops on the ground and outsource it. We had contractors like Blackwater. We had uh, KBR did all our dining facilities and and maintenance and upkeep inside the, the operating bases. And then, so, more toys. He wanted us to use all these high-tech, uh, keep the government contractors uh, in business, which would also help the soldiers, obviously. But uh, I, I still think, for example, as a military police officer, he wanted us to use uh, high-tech equipment to smell for explosive devices. Well, we had dogs. Dogs worked fine, bomb-sniffing dogs. But uh, we, there were yeah, always. If it's started, not broken, don't fix it. It's yeah. not right. And we had Bluetooth, Bluetooth. We had Blue Force trackers. We talked about in Vietnam, we didn't have Blue Force trackers. Well, Blue Force trackers are what the Air Force has. They can track aircraft in the air. Well, Blue Force trackers were, weren't were at the uh, evolution where all the troops and all the vehicles had them when we initially started. We got the Blue Force trackers so we can track our own units, but we didn't have them all at the time. We used drones. Uh, to look around our perimeter and see out. So a lot of the technology was there. But the bottom line is you have to have uh, boots on the ground in order to sustain and maintain victory. You can't do it as a drive-by, uh, drop bombs and, <laughs> and blow up the enemy's uh, resources in key locations. Um, okay, so going on into this next phase, sort of your leadership um, what, describe your next phase. So you're, because yeah. I, I, I know that there's the general phase, but there's not this mediary phase in between. Well, the to get to general, um, you start in the officer ranks. There, there are very rare occasions where you get direct commission, like it happens in Vietnam. The, the sergeants, the officers get killed, and even in World War II, the officers get killed off in a battle, and they give you, as a senior NCO, a direct <laughs> so there's a quick path. Uh, yeah, quick path, right, <laughs> to to move up the chain of command. So you get a commission, but then you still have to meet the standards of that rank and that level in the military to move up, whether it's mm -hmm. educational, uh, military standards, uh, military education, firing a weapon, physical standards, uh, 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 all that type of thing. So you start off as an, either an enlisted or an officer. So I done the enlisted time I branched into the uh, moved into the officer environment and and we moved up the chain from company level 
which is the first three uh, levels of officer, to uh, battalion level. How many people in a battalion? Uh, these days, it could be 800 to 1,000. So it's 800 to 1,000 in a battalion. And the level below that is squadron? Company. Company. So, yeah. so company is anywhere. Uh, a ballpark figure is 200 people in a company. It could be 180. It could be 220. So there's four companies that make up a battalion. Usually. Usually. Uh -huh. And then sometimes if the Army is going extra strong, they'll have five and have a, a have two battalions in reserve and three battalions up front, so to speak. Okay. So... so Keep, so, keep so I was a uh, brigade commander in my last tour. I had a brigade staff, and I had five battalions that I was responsible for. Each of those battalions had companies and troops that, that completed their mission. So what are some of the lessons of leadership you got along the way, and how did you grow into leadership? Or did it come naturally to you? Did you have to... I mean, you're, you're having to make some decisions where you know people are going to get injured and die, and yeah? Yeah, of course. And so how do you, how, I guess, so there's two parts of that question. One is sort of just, there's an attrition rate of the people that do and don't make good leaders, and you rose up through the ranks as one that does lead well. So what were the qualities that you see both in yourself and in others like you that make good leaders? And okay. can rise through the ranks. And then also, how do you sit with those kinds of decisions where you know people are going to die and you're sending people out to do stuff that just isn't, you know, <laughs> victory is measured in a different way than a corporate bottom line like Cisco. Right. Well, in one respect, in, in a more humorous sense, the Army is like the Boy Scouts, right? You're, you're always going to have leadership, adult leadership. Well, in the military, you always have someone that's higher ranking than you. So you have somebody that you report to. They coach, teach, mentor, and advise you, and you get at least, at the minimum, annual report from them, just like in corporate America, where they tell you what your strengths and weaknesses are. You go in before you even start your job and get a counseling from that the senior person that you report to. So there's a really good mentoring program yes, in place. Pretty okay. good, pretty good mentoring. However, you might not have day-to-day -day interaction with that person and maybe spotty, if, especially in a combat environment. You're in one location, they're in a different location, but... Uh, you know what their expectations is. The commander above you has his commander's objectives that he wants you to accomplish, like in corporate America. So you you make sure that you accomplish the commander's objectives above you. You get coached, teached, and mentored uh, by that person. So as a kid, were you somebody that seemed to lead pretty naturally anyway? Did people kind of want to follow you and... Well, you know, yeah, I some would, people have that ability. Yeah, some people are, do. I typically... I'm thinking back on it, not necessarily. I, I was more happy-go-lucky kind of guy. In high school, I was an average kid in high school. Um, but, I, but I excelled when I got to college. and I was motivated because I had already been to Vietnam. I'd seen you know, the, the good and the bad of, of man. And I actually came back from Vietnam with um, survivor guilt. My, my kind of PTSD from Vietnam was survivor guilt. I never got wounded in Vietnam. I saw a lot of, a lot of carnage in Vietnam. For example... One of the missions that we went on, they put my team on this hilltop, and they put another six-man team on another hilltop a couple miles away, and then within two days, that whole team was annihilated. They were just, none of them came back alive, right? And you think back at that later, they could have easily have been switched, right? They could have put us on that hilltop and put them on our hilltop, and, and we could have all been killed and not come back. So... Reflect that was May the 11th, 1970. That day still sticks in my mind. Mm. So those six guys that came back were my age, my peers, and I tried to lead my life knowing that that they didn't have the opportunity to move forward in their life. So in a sense, I was I had survivor guilt that why am I still here? Why what What's God's mission for me? Why am I still on the earth, right? So I tried to live my life somewhat with the with the knowledge knowing that these six men had, hadn't been able to come out of it alive so i was always trying to do the right thing right just like in the movie save it private Ryan. yeah i was just thinking right? about the that. same side of, sort of scenario make it a life worth living make it a life how, worth living yeah. right men have died and throughout our history and in the history of mankind people have laid down their life for us so we could live the life that we're now living so i tried to make my life in sense to pay back for those six men 
not just those six men because we lost more than that, but yeah. that was the, the six. The one that really hit deep. The ones that hit deep for me. So so it gives you a renewed sense of purpose in there, too. Right. It sure does. Um, did I want to talk about purpose. I, the one question I want to get to before we go into that, though, is were you involved in a lot of team sports when you were a kid? Team sports. Or just uh, team situations? Yeah, well, not sports as much. I was in the band. Uh, in high school, I played in the marching band in high school. I played football, and um, I was in the, like like you, I was in the dirt biking and water biking. So I was both in team sports from football and from, uh, I like baseball. My I was my dad was big in baseball, so I was the oldest of four sons. We were all in Little League, so we grew up through the Little League chain, and mm-hmm. all of my six sons played in Little League because I was their coach, their manager, and or umpire in different leagues. Okay, so yeah, so the, <laughs> so. the question, uh, the, the uh, response I was looking for, and he provided it, is that you had been in team situations when you were a kid and growing up where you were comfortable in it. Yes. Some people like myself, this is where I kind of diverge from that. I had, I had a bad experience in Little League, and um, there was actually a key point where I said I would, I'll never get involved with a team sport again. Oh. And that's when I got into cross country running and, you know, sort of solo whitewater kayaking and, you know, all these sports that you do on your own. Right. So there's nobody else that has to take consequences for your, how you are in there. And same for me. Right. And it's had a deep impact and, you know, both a positive and negative way on my life. Um, but you came in a place of comfort. I mean, you just, you know, it was just a natural thing to be as part of a team, whether it was a band or football or, you know, as a manager for the teams and stuff. So right. that was what I was curious about. Um, let's go back to uh, purpose. Um, so God, I'd love to finish up this general part, too, though. Let's finish up the general and come back to purpose. Do we okay. have, you have enough time? Sure. Okay. So as a general, you're up there. You're playing both a political kind of dance. You know, the, the amount of things you have to juggle grows exponentially, right? It's not just about, poly, about war anymore. It's about all these things that you're managing. And how do you kind of expand your capacity or how, di- how was your capacity expanded as you kept rising up? And especially at the general level. What new qualities did you have in yourself um, that enabled you to do that, that you picked up along the way? Okay. Well, as a reserve component general, being different than an active component general, which we're not, we are a community-based organization versus institutional, where I'm not on a military base. and I have close proximity to my staff and my uh, people. As reserve component, I was in charge of a unit that was in Michigan, Inkster, Michigan, and I had outlying units in 17 states, so, and the reality is, and I told people, for the three plus years I was brigade commander, my car spent more time in the long-term parking lot at the airport (laughs) than it did on my driveway, because (laughs) it would be typical for, I would be gone five, six, seven days in a row, be home for a couple days, and then take off again, because I was either working with higher headquarters at a conference uh, training session, or going to my subordinate units, working with them, uh, helping them, coaching, teaching, mentoring my junior leaders so that they could be effective in their missions because if they're not successful, we're not successful. So it's kind of a teamwork. And it's kind of a built thing. You, you go, you get trained on it yourself, and then you go out and in, you know, implement the training that you've got. The Army is very big into leadership, and they train for leadership. They have NCO leaders. They have officer leader. Every level of military has a certain level and expectation of training that goes with to be a leader. Huh, okay. So when your time in general was actually spent stateside. Um, for the most part, except uh-huh. for except for the, the 400 days that we were assigned to, to travel to Iraq and do my mission in Iraq. So we were, my whole unit was activated from the reserve component out of Michigan. And in fact, the Army was so short, Army Reserve was so short of troops at that time because we were about eight years into the war, that we were only 50% where they had to draw in people from from cross-level people into I, my unit from other units so that we can go over and complete our mission. Huh. So we were on 400-day orders and went over to Iraq, came back, and then 
about 50% of the unit went back to their, their own unit, and the rest of the unit stayed in Detroit. So um, you want to talk about that Iraq piece? Is there something special to be gleaned from your experience there? Uh, you brought Hussein in. Right. And we're Saddam. watching him. What was... And then we also had the, the, the high-level detainees, the, the pack of 55, the... You know, the deck of 55 yeah. that they had. So we had those in our custody. Saddam Hussein, U.S. always had physical custody of him, even though uh, uh, jurisdictional-wise, and every, it was the Iraqi government that told us, you know, take him to Iraqi High Tribunal on Saturday because he's going to go to court. So we would you know, transport him to court, bring him back. We gave him haircuts. We uh, helped clean and bathe him and, and all that. And, and towards the end, actually... Uh, Saddam tried to warm up, as he typically did, tried to warm up to uh, the people that were keeping him in, in custody, and he wrote poetry every night. So he'd write poetry, and, and then the next morning, he would give it to the soldier or talk, tell a soldier his poetry, and then they would take that poetry and keep it as a collector's item. Well, mm -hmm. after a while, they, they shut that off because... They didn't want him to get too friendly with the troops, for example, and, mm -hmm. and didn't want to get get that. So he wrote the poetry, but he kept it to himself. And he also had a a monthly allotment of Cuban cigars. So he was given <laughs> Cuban cigars. After a while, he was allowed visitors in, you know, foreign foreign dignitaries from other countries and family members. So he would have somebody come in to to talk with them and, and sit in his in his area where he was, and they'd sit and have a smoke and talk and. And they would leave. What do you remember most about um, the challenges of watching over a high-level uh, person like him, well, prisoner? Anything um, from Saddam? No, because he was in a remote, secret location, and uh, where Saddam was was in a bombed-out area. When we initially had the shock and awe phase, yeah, and we bombed a lot. <laughs> Actually, Saddam had sixty-five palaces. Uh, presidential palaces in Iraq that were huge, three to four stories high. You've probably seen pictures of them. Yeah. Had gold inlaid toilets and, and on awnings and gold inlaid doors. And all the money and expense went for him and his cronies. And the example was he had 24 hospitals in the whole country of 26 million people. And he had 65 presidential palaces. So you can see, and only about a third of Baghdad, population of 6 million people, had plumbed in electricity and power. So wow. he they they had the resources to put power in for everybody, but it wasn't on that. It was on him and his cronies and people that they wanted him to stay in power. Um, let's go back to purpose. Okay. Um, you found so you were talking about how um, the people on the next hill over right. didn't right. make it, right? And that impacted you very deeply. Right. And you've made a, cho a decision at that point, at some level, really deep level, that you were going to live your life as, um, what's the right word? I don't know. Make it a life worth living. A life worth living, right? Yeah. Live a good life and, and leave, uh, and do the most I could in the time allotted for me to make up for the fact that at least those six guys weren't able to move forward their life. They weren't able to have a family, have a job, contribute to society. So this is kind of a PTSD moment for you, yeah? Right, right. So describe what that felt like, what the experience was like, not just the outer part, but the inner part that really I believe is what probably was the motivation that then drove you to do it. Because it's not something you think, oh, okay, you don't think that right. through, I'm going to make it a life worth living. It's a deep entrenched feeling that comes up. Correct. And maybe describe that. In a way that other people that are facing something similar might understand and give them hope to get through their own experience like that. Right. Well, I think you have a good sense for that, Doug. It's not something you think about. It's not something that you reflect back on. It's kind of ingrained in you at that point. And then over time, there's quiet times in your life when you think, hey, what can I be doing? Uh, for example, you know, getting up early, get up at four in the morning and do physical training and do push-ups and do four or five mile runs before the sun even gets up and go to school at night. All my degrees were were done at night school. I had a, got up at four o'clock in the morning, went to the gym, uh, did running, uh, went to the office when I was in the reserve component. I was in the civilian world, 
came home, had a, had a large family. I was involved in my kids' schooling, involved with their activities after school, baseball, um, scouting. So it kept me busy. I'd rather be busy than bored. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so and, and I go to school two nights a week. And when I graduated from school 11 years later, I taught night school for another 10 years. So I was teaching night school at the graduate and, and undergraduate level. So I, I taught night school two nights a week. Let's go back, though, to that ex- that experience, that single experience of the of your people that you knew or, you know, the company that was just right over on the next hill that didn't make it and how that, um, what was that journey like? Just that specific journey going in. How long did it last? What, you know, inside where you were like, uh, where it had, it was kind of working its way through you inside. And then finally it kind of came out and expressed itself. And like, I'm going to make this a life worth living. Right. I, I don't think it was a mental thought process. It was just like, Anytime there's a crisis in, in life that you experience, you, you later you reflect about it. What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? What if this happened? What did that happen? So you, you kind of in, internally reflect, and it, it happens in a short period of time, and then you ingrain it inside you and say, hey, you know, that could have been me. That could have been us. So, you know, take this opportunity because you've got another fresh day to start with. You might not have that day tomorrow. So accomplish and do as much as you can today to enrich your life, give back to society, and help those around you. Yeah, uh, there's, in my own experience of going through that dark place when I lost a lot of my vision, it felt like there was sort of the dark night of the soul. Right. Kind of a way I've heard it described. It, it's There's a sensation, for me, there was a sensation of, <sighs> and it was like, combination of hopelessness and an emptiness like this and it was i'm trying to just you know i'm actually trying to point to where it was where i actually felt the sensations of it because it's a body felt thing Uh um and then it comes and it's a natural part of grieving i think uh i don't know i'm always curious about this area right you obviously came through it empowered right um well, I'm not. I I can understand what you're saying, but I don't think it would had a physical manifestation inside me in terms of I was hurt here, I was heartbroken, or I had mental uh, depression. Uh, conversely, on the other side, I think I, I knew I had to keep myself busy. I didn't want a lot of downtime because the old saying. Of, Idle mind is the devil's workshop, so to speak. I wanted to always keep busy and always keep active, read books, go to school, engage with people, uh, talk with people, um, just keep keep myself busy. So uh, rather than have that, and I did have quiet times, of course. Uh, one of the things I did enjoy was getting on my dirt bike and traveling, not extensively, uh, but traveling out in the woods and shut my motorcycle down and to sit and reflect and think about, you know, my life and where I'm going and what I want to do. There's periods so busy, of, not bored. <laughs> right, busy, not bored, right? <laughs> That's a really good... Uh, Acronym, huh? Yeah, in fact, it's if you were to have three um, suggestions for people looking for purpose, maybe in the later part of their life, what could you pass on from your own experience? So you're living your purpose now in part anyway by helping veterans. Correct, yeah. Um, and I'm in the board, on the board of four veteran service organizations, and I support a couple of other ones. So, yeah, I, I, I have a passion to help veterans because they've given so much to our country. In fact, I, I have a little saying that I say to most of our veterans groups that I've been to is that you, as a veteran, have given more to our country. When you look at yourself in the morning and you're shaving or you're looking in the mirror, you can look in there and know that you've given more to your country than you will ever take back. Mm-hmm. because less than 1% of our population of 350 million people are in the military. Less than 3 million people are on active or reserve component military. So less than 1% of our U.S. population has, is serving in the military. Hmm. So, you know, they, they have given a lot for us. They've, they've paid the price, and their families have paid the price. The soldiers that were killed and not, didn't come back, they left families behind. They left wives behind. So the family has to pick up and 
and move on without their loved one. And what is the um, reward you get within yourself for supporting like that? I mean, obviously, there's got to be the part that drives you to do it. Um, so what what's the uh, what's the experience for you? The the experience is I feel I'm at a point in my life where I can help people uh, give back in my community, give back to people that that may have not had the advantage of having the experiences I had and the ability to do things that I have. So sharing some of my experience in my my past and my support for those people can in their community can help them. Mm -hmm. So. And similarly, rather than a lot of times if you have some like PTSD issues, you, you go to the VA, for example, and you talk to a therapist or somebody who is very trained and very versed at, at what they're doing, but they don't necessarily have had the same experiences because they may not have even served in the military, for example. Mm -hmm. So having uh, been there, done that, <clears throat> I could talk from experience, not that I'm braggadocious, but I could talk similarly, you know, almost like the same tribe we're from the same tribe so we've had similar experiences yeah. your experience will be different than mine obviously even if we did the same mission that we can relate to each other so uh, i guess people can relate to my experiences because i've done you know yeah. very similar experiences to them and they're done that and i know the feeling and when yeah. you reach out to somebody like that um it opens up a it opens up a door for somebody. It brings some spaciousness and some light into a place. This is my own experience now that I'm passing on, but it gives hope. Right. It's so easy for people, I think, that have gone through a deep traumatic place to get constricted into a, a dark hole or a dark cage. Right. And somebody that can open up the door and truly just let them be heard, give them a place to come outside of themselves can be so powerful. Right, right. And, um, and I know you mentioned in your prior talks about you kind of worked it down to your bucket list, right? And your bucket list was kind of the turning point in your life where you have these things you want to accomplish in your life. Yeah. Is at a point where you're not going to accomplish them if, if you don't continue on and, and go forward with that. So you add things to your bucket life. It's your kind of purpose in life. What, <clears throat> what you want to accomplish it it's funny it. it's transformed too though it first started out as just it's like do this so you don't go checking out right right but then it gave me an opera the first one just came off so well you know it's like where i got through the eye of the needle it's like well oh my god what could i do with these second and third ones to make them even more than they were originally set to be and the second one was about growth and the third one is about giving which is really what your life is about now right so what's your top three tips for people that are looking for purpose or seeking to give back now that maybe they're in their golden years or they're at a point where they can do that i would say you know for, for the start from the basics look after yourself right because you have your your body is the only place you're ever going to live so look after yourself mentally and physically uh -huh. whatever it takes to keep yourself energized Get enough sleep, eat the right foods, and, and be with people that you want to be with because they have similar goals or expectations or similar themes to their life that you can attach yourself to and be part of. So keep yourself strong mentally, physically, and emotionally so that you have the energy and capacity to be with people and be around people that have the same similar goals as you versus okay. having friction all the time. Okay, next one. Uh, I would say that kind of like you had said, have, have a list of things that you want to accomplish. It doesn't, that's, you don't have to say, you know, I'm going to finish this by the end of the month or I can't check it off my list. It, maybe it'll take more than a month to cook, to accomplish, but have some, some things you want to accomplish in your life. They could be big or they could be small. And then think about your legacy. When you're not here anymore, what is your legacy going to be? What are, gonna, what are people going to say about you? Right. Uh -huh. Or, are you going to leave a lasting impression on people? Are you going to motivate the generation behind you or the generations behind you? And they can look to you and say, hey, Doug is, is a world-bound author, adventurer, and he's been around a lot of people, and he, he's gleaned lessons for them that he can use and pass on to other people. So as we all have a purpose in life, and I think 
some of that purpose in life is to motivate and be an example. Whether it's bad or good, we get a lot of bad examples on TV from the news, for example. Yeah, but, <laughs> don't we? Especially, <laughs> right? especially right now. <laughs> right? And, and, and so you can on the ver on the other side of that, you can hang around people that are positive and energetic and ha have similar goals. Join organizations that you want to be part of, whether it's Save the Whale or uh, you know H Hug a Tree or whatever you whatever 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 is passionate for you, uh, do it and and live to it. So, all right. Anything else you want to add on? Yeah, I would say that don't go down life because your mother or father or your brother or a friend says, hey, you've got these talents. I think you should exploit them. Go from what's in your heart and, and what passion that you really want to have. You might, might have a passion for journalism or or passion for being in the military, or passion to play football or basketball, and, and you might think, hey, that won't be a career path that can put bread on the table and pay the rent, but something will evolve out of that that will be able to make you a richer person mentally, physically, and emotionally, and financially, versus going to school to be an accountant, because that's going to put bread on the table and pay the rent for you. So uh -huh. live your life by the passion that's in your heart, and not by what you think the job opportunities will be down the road. So form your life based on your passion and not just necessarily what's available out in the world today. And what indicators do you have in your own life that when you know that you're on track with your passion? Great question. Well, you know you're on track because you feel satisfied at the end of the day. You wake up in the morning with purpose. When you put your feet on the ground, you say, oh, I've got to get out and accomplish these things today. You've got a mental plan in your head what you want to do that day versus lying in bed and hitting the snooze uh -huh. again and again and saying, oh, man, i got to go to the office today or i got to go here today and think about that. So, it's a type of energy you feel, yeah? Right. So it's a kind of an energy feel that you work on yourself mentally and get your focus and, and purpose of life. All right. General, Robert, if well, thanks very much for doing this interview with us. Well, it's, it's an honor and privilege yes. to talk with you, Doug, and all the success in your life in the future. Thanks, and you too. Thank you. <laughs> all right, brother.